Hey, good morning. What a great morning it is to celebrate baptisms this morning. I'm always, always encouraged by that and moved by the testimonies and seeing people getting baptized. And I love that we have a church that does this and does this not just once in a while, but somewhat regularly. And as Pastor Ken said, we had a bunch that we did at the lake. And I love that uh, they just keep coming in and people keep making that decision to go public with their faith through water baptism. And I want to encourage you in your faith and what you're doing this morning as well and, and your next step. And as Ken said, we have a lot of great ways for you to connect here in the life of the church for your next step. This morning, before I jump into the message, and if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 10. And that's going to be our main text this morning, Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 46. It will be the main text as we continue uh, discussing how to break the chains off in our life and different things. And this morning, we're going to be talking about breaking the chains from the crowd and how do we break loose from the culture and the crowd around us. But before we do that, I really want to spend just a few moments here in the beginning of the message to express uh, my heart and our heart of a church. Thursday at 5 p.m., I was sitting at my daughter's volleyball game, like many of you were out doing different things, and I started to receive text messages and phone calls, and uh, whether it was through social media or direct text, asking if I had heard the news of what was going on. And so myself and a bunch of parents that were sitting by quickly got our phones out and started looking, and to our horror, we began to see uh, the evil that was happening right here five miles from this church in Headingham. And Thursday, 5 p.m., a 15-year-old uh, shoots and kills five people and injures two other people. Our community, our neighbors, uh, just close to here, Headingham, Nightdale High School. Our community lost sons, we lost husbands, we lost wives, uh, we lost mothers. And so we grieve and we mourn this morning the senseless and evil act that's happening in families of those who have lost loved ones. I spent the weekend, quite honestly, trying to craft how to say what to say not only this morning, but how to post something, and I kept coming for a loss of words. Uh, many of you know my own son is a Raleigh police officer, and uh, I want to say on behalf of my wife, Stacy and I, how much we appreciate it immediately. I can't even tell you how many texts and phone calls and messages we got asking about Parker, and uh, just as a dad and a pastor, that, that meant the world to me. Um, it's times like this we recognize that there's hurts and pains, there's grieving that's happening, there's the question of why. I spent the weekend, probably like many of you, just wondering why. Uh, why did this happen? Why in our community? Why again? I also recognize that at times like this, there's also past trauma and hurts that surface. There's past injustices, there's past equities that have happened, there's past pains, there's past mistreatments, violence, death, suffering that weren't just about this one instance, but the past instances, and the questions that emerged from all of that. This past week brought more feelings and even fear as we notice on the news that the Parkland shooter got life imprisonment, and so again, it brings back the past. And for some people, it brings back anger, it brings back despair. For some people, it brings a lack of trust to our justice system, and all through it, and we ask the questions, why? These are the moments when we never really know why. We might never know why at all. And so I try to formulate, how, what do we do as not only a church, but what do we do as Christians? So not just what do we do as people, but how does a church respond and how do Christians respond being the hands and the feet of Jesus? And I just kept coming back to two main things, and the two main things are simply this, that we need to reach out to God during these times. And that's not a scapegoat answer, that's not a a fluff church answer, that's the reality. I think often when we see things happen in our community and even in our own life, we try to immediately see how we can fix it or find the problem why or what happened. We know at the root of evil is sin. Regardless of what it looks like, regardless of how it comes out, it's sin. We also recognize that there's a God that we use this word sovereign around. To be quite honest with you, I struggle sometimes with that word sovereign just to be transparent with our church family. I don't know if you ever struggle with that word sovereign. The word that says that God knows all, is in all, created all, has everything in control. And I trust that, and I know that, but I struggle with that sometimes. And it's times like this weekend that I struggle with that. I know it's real, and I don't doubt it, and I don't doubt God in the middle of it, but there's a struggle. And so how do I respond? Well, 
just because I feel the way I feel doesn't mean I have to not follow scripture. And just because of the emotions that you may be feeling never negates scripture, nor does it supersede what God's plan is for our life. And so as frustrated as we might be, as hurt, <clears throat> as angry, disappointed, fear, on and on it goes, it doesn't change the fact that God is still God. It doesn't change the fact that the scripture is still scripture. And as a Christian first, I am called to follow scripture, which means I lean hard into God at times like this. I lean hard into God in my prayer time, and even in my prayer time, I find myself sometimes having a conversation with God, asking the hard questions and wondering. And to be quite honest with you, God can handle our questions and our fears. And part of the response of prayer is not just for God, it's, it's on our side to be able to give to God what we're feeling and what we're going through. I've been in this community 18 years. Uh, I've been in Henningham a bunch of times. We have families that live there. I golfed on that wonderful top-tier golf course at times. It's right down the street. So we were leaning into God, but then the other side of it that I keep coming back to is this is the time for us to lean onto one another, to lean towards each other. These are times to encourage one another. These are times to listen. Sometimes you just have to listen to what people are feeling and going through. You listen to the hurt. You listen to the pain. And you don't have an answer for it. But you listen. And you listen well. And you encourage one another. Whether that's through text or phone calls. You check in on one another. You check in to see how people are doing. Whether they live there or they live somewhere else. Isn't it amazing how during these times how quickly we turn to our family and appreciate who we have and what we have. It's amazing to think that in, in a moment's notice, that can change. And none of us are immune to it. And so at this time, we lean into God and we pray and we take it to God and we allow the sovereign God of the universe to heal us. And then we also lean to one another. And you hear it said often to hold your families a little closer, to acknowledge what you do have and who you do have in your life, and to lift one another up. Scripture is filled with verses that speak about encouraging one another, bearing one another's pains and burdens, lift one another up, and this is the time that we need to do that. And so I just wanted to open this morning by acknowledging that, uh, that this has happened in our community, and how we respond really determines to each one of us how we respond in our own environments as well. But before I jumped into the message, I wanted to just pray for our community. I pray for Nightdale High School as they're going to be dealing with this all week. We pray for Headingham. We pray for all those families. We pray for all the first responders that are going in there and doing what they do as well. And, and for each one of us that have our own stuff on top of that and our own feelings that are mixed in. And the sad thing is some people, they saw it and they just said, well, here we go again. Just another, another day. How sad is it that in our culture that's what's happening? We see that happen and you're just like, yep, that, that's it. Okay, let's go, let's go eat. I mean, what are you going to do? And it's sad that we see that happen. So would you mind just closing your eyes and if you're with your family or spouse, would you just join hands with them and, and just join me in prayer as we just pray <clears throat> for what's happened here in our community. God, this morning we come to you and, and to some degree we are grieving beyond measure almost to the point where you're not even sure how to grieve. You, you see it happen on the news, and, and you watch it, and you hear it, and you hear it for the next several days and weeks, and then, and then we're kind of on to the next crisis, it seems like. We're struggling to make sense of this. We're struggling for the, all the questions that we might never know, those why questions that infiltrate our heart and our mind. They distract us. They keep us up at night. It causes us at times even to question our faith. So Lord, this morning together as a church family, we not only pray with and for each other here in this room, for the chapel, for those at Wake Forest, for those online, but we pray for the communities and the zip codes that you have put this church in. And by that, Lord, you have put people into every community in this triangle. Lord, I pray for those families that live in Headingham from this church. I pray for those families that couldn't get home for hours because their streets were blocked off, wondering what was going on. 
We pray that you would just bring them peace. We pray for those that might even be afraid right now just even to go outside of their house, whether they live there or not. We pray against fear. We pray, God, for the families of those specifically who lost loved ones. Lord, today as they are grieving still and trying to make sense of that, I pray that we as a church family will lift each one of them up in prayer. That we lift up their kids and their spouses, their extended family and neighbors. God, we pray for those in our community that are hurting just all around. For those that this instance has brought up other hurts and pains, other feelings that they're wrestling with from past things they've seen and past traumas they've been through. It feels at times that this just rips those back open. So we pray for the God of comfort. We pray for the verse that says that God gave us a peace that passes understanding. We pray for that peace even right now. And Lord, I pray that that each one of us will look for ways to not only lift each other up, but look for ways to minister and love well in our community. The days are getting darker. They are not getting brighter. God, you told us as much that this world would have problems and troubles, and it's going to increasingly get worse. But at the same time, you prayed not to take your disciples from the world, but to put them into the world for a purpose and a reason. And that purpose and reason was to be salt and to be light, a city on the hill that gives hope. So, Lord, we pray for hope this morning. We thank you for those we have around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you for letting me say that and do that. And hopefully, to some degree, that maybe has helped some of you as well. It's never easy to turn the corner to go into a message after that. And so we're going to do the best we can to turn the corner to the message. And the title this morning for taking notes is Breaking the Chains of the Crowd. We've been in this series for a couple weeks now, and we have one more next week that we're going to put it all together. And we've been talking through what does it look like in our life to break the chains of condemnation off of our life? What does it look like to break the chains off of comparison in our life and compromise in our life? And I've so appreciated just hearing and seeing the results of what God continues to do in our life. And I think this one this morning is another one that's going to hit home in a strong way because we deal with it all the time. We deal with the pressures of the crowd, and next to the crowd in your notes, you could put a little dash and put culture, because it's similar in some regard that we not only are dealing with the crowd of people around us, but we're also dealing with the culture around us that seems to want us to chain us to things of the culture and things of the crowd. I want to take us to Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. I really enjoy this passage of scripture for several reasons, but to me it gives the, the picture not only of blind Bartimaeus crying out to Jesus, but to some degree it gives us a picture of the world that is crying out for something. And they might not know what it is or or who he is, but this world is blind and lost, sitting in darkness. And we as Christ's ambassadors walk past the world and culture every day with the hope that they actually need. And so I love this picture that it shows us. And so we're going to start in verse 10, or verse 46 of chapter 10. It says, and they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. And he said, call him. And he called to the man, saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? I always find that it's interesting. We see Jesus do that several times. The person's blind, and yet Jesus is asking, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man says to him, Rabbi... Let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go on your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Let's put some context around this passage first. Before we get to the main points today, let me put some context because Jesus is heading with his disciples. This is key. He's heading to Jerusalem for Passover. And it was very customary for rabbis to not only be accompanied by their disciples, but also accompanied by a great crowd. 
This is towards the end of Jesus' ministry. This is the last miracle that Mark accounts. And Jesus is walking towards Jericho. And Jericho is situated in the middle of a fertile and well-watered country. It's celebrated for its scents and its palm trees. It's situated about 16 to 18 miles from, Jer from Jerusalem. So they're on their way to it. It's about six miles where the Jordan River bends. And according to Spence Jones, it says that Jericho is one of the most important cities at this time next to Jerusalem. I thought this is interesting that this journey from Jericho to the Jordan of Jericho is flat country, but from Jericho to Jerusalem is very hilly. And it's supposed that it was upon the rocky heights overhanging the city that the Lord's temptation took place. So Jesus and his disciples are heading into Passover. People from all over are going to the city to celebrate Passover, and they're going through Jerusalem. It's also important to note that blind Bartimaeus didn't accidentally call Jesus the son of David. In fact, this is the first time that Jesus called this title in the book of Mark. It's referencing to the Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah will be the descendant of David. And Bartimaeus uses this title, and according to Barry, it says that he was clearly implying political implications of who Jesus was. To some degree, Bartimaeus, by this notion of son of David, had faith in Jesus at some degree. And it's also interesting that Jesus doesn't silence him. It's amazing to me that God chose to use a blind beggar on the side of the road to acknowledge that this is the son of David that the Old Testament had prophesied. And so it's, all of this is happening before any miracle even happens. You've got the future of Jesus knowing that in just a few days he's going to the cross. He's heading into Jerusalem for the final time before the crucifixion to celebrate Passover where he already knows that he will be betrayed and captured and beaten and crucified. He's walking through Jericho. All these other emotions I'm sure are rising. I'm sure as Jesus is walking that he's noticing that this is where the temptation was and this is where this is happening. He's walking through this at the time, a beautiful city of the time, and he gets called to by a beggar on the side of the road. Who also, by the way, isn't it interesting that it was the crowd who told the blind beggar not to bother Jesus. They told him to be quiet. They silenced him. And the blind beggar didn't listen to the crowd. Instead, what did he do? He yelled louder. He didn't listen to the crowd tell him to be quiet. He didn't listen to the crowd to tell him that he wasn't important enough for Jesus. He ignored the crowd and began to yell even louder. So let's jump into this this morning. Point number one is this about how do we break the chains off the crowd. The first one is realizing that being chained to the crowd causes the temptation to please other people. When you and I are chained to the crowd, whether that's culture, whether that's social media crowd, whether that's the crowd in our neighborhood, in our community, whether it's the crowd in our job or in our workplace, wherever we are, when we are chained to that crowd, the, the temptation then is just to please the crowd. Bartimaeus could have just pleased the crowd by just being quiet and sitting in his blindness. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10, it says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? And I think that is a question, church, that each one of us need to wrestle with maybe even this morning. Is your life here to please the crowd or to please God? Are we looking for the approval of the crowd? Are we looking for the approval of our classmates? Are we looking for the approval of coworkers, of neighbors? Are we looking for the approval of your pastor or ministry or small group? Or are you and I here for the approval of God? He goes on and says, am I trying to please man? If I were still playing, trying to please man, I would not be a, a servant of Christ. In other words, if you are here to try to please other human beings, it's going to be really hard for you to be the servant of Jesus because the temptation is going to follow the crowd instead of following Jesus. So what happens when your faith goes directly opposed to the culture and the crowd? Who are you going to follow? What happens when your core convictions don't match the core convictions of your job, of your career, of your team? What happens when your morals and your ethics that you're following are in opposition of humanity? And it's not real hard to pull 
multiple examples probably from this past week of your own life. You see, if we try to prove man, we find approval of humanity. It deflates our servanthood to Jesus. In Acts chapter 5, verse 29, it says, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. You'll see this constant theme throughout the disciples in the New Testament of when they're pressed to be silent or pressed to leave. Their go-to answer is very similar to what Peter and the apostles answered. We have to obey God, not you. And at the end of the day, we have to obey God and not culture. Amen, somebody. That is what we have to do. I haven't mentioned that in the beginning, and I, f I f see this happen. And, and I do see the tension that many people face because the temptation and the tension is that our emotions and our connection to people in the crowd, if we're not careful, will have a tendency to dictate our theology of God. And instead of following the word of God, we start to withdraw from it, and temptation is to please people instead of pleasing God. And here's a few things that I wrote down about the crowd, and I would suggest you jot these down real quickly under point number one, about the crowd, of why we have to stand against the crowd and culture, otherwise we fall into temptation. Here it is, the crowd, they have a different conviction than you do. The crowd, when we speak of the crowd, I'm speaking of those that are opposed to gospel, the gospel, they're opposed to scripture, they're the culture, the media that, that are directly opposed to that, even the crowd that maybe you follow, but they have a different level of convictions that you and I follow. You've been noticing this lately. Uh, there are many things about this time of year that I thoroughly love. I, I love fall. I love fall. What I hate are the political commercials that come with fall. <laughs> I was tired of those after the first one I saw. I'm like, oh, we have months of this. I looked at Stacey the other day, and I don't even know who the person was. I'm not going to mention any names, but the commercial was opposing somebody because they wanted to ban abortions. And that seems to be the, the big one right now that I keep seeing. Don't vote for this person because they want to ban abortions. And I'm going, well, you just gave me a reason to vote for them. Even though I don't know anything more about them and not saying to vote for any one particular person. But I see that, and I'm like, that's the difference of convictions, isn't it? On one side, you got people, and I'm just going to use this one example because you could plug and play, but this one is very real, very now, and you're going to hear this from the media tons over this political season where you're going to see constantly, you're going to see the side of convictions about abortion versus not abortion, pro-life, pro-choice. And you're going to see this dilemma, and what a picture that is, isn't it? Where the world, to some degree, celebrates the fact that they can choose to have an abortion, and you got the other side going, but that's biblically wrong. There, there's no biblical mandate whatsoever to say yes to that. The convictions of this world oftentimes are not the convictions of God. And if you're trying to please the world, the temptation is for you just to please them, which often results in you just being quiet and just walking away in silence, shaking your head going, oh, that's terrible awful the crowd has their own truth we see this to be true relative truth right how often do we deal with relative truth it's my truth it's my life it's my way doesn't matter what the bible says doesn't matter what you say that's good for you that's true for you but it's not true for me the crowd has its own truth the crowd has their own agenda you see it ramping up more and more and more. There is an agenda that the crowd has. And every side that you look, every news media source you see has their own agenda. They have their own side, their own convictions, their own truth, their own agendas. The crowd also at times might be from within. What's amazing to me in Mark chapter 10 is that this is a crowd of disciples who had seen Jesus do miracles and are now telling a blind person to be quiet. How ironic is that? The crowd of supposed followers of Jesus, disciples of him, who had seen about three years of ministry, of healings, Peter literally walked on water. You see all these things happening, and now there's a blind guy on the side of the road, and the crowd is just telling them to be quiet. Don't bother Jesus. We're on the way to celebrate Passover. Passover. Leave him alone. 
Overly righteous. Ecclesiastes speaks about that, doesn't it? Be not overly righteous. When we are overly righteous, we have a tendency to even turn against ourselves, to turn against the crowd. One final thing about the crowd before I go to point two, the crowd says, come follow us. But Jesus says, come follow me. If you want to know the difference between the crowd and Jesus, the crowd will always say, come follow us. Come follow us. Do what we do, say what we say, believe what we believe, have the convictions we have, and Jesus says, no, you got to come follow me. And if you come follow me, it's going to be against the crowd. It's going to be against the convictions of the world. At times, it's going to be in polar opposite to what culture is saying. Which leads to number two, the second potential of being chained to the crowd. The first two points, by the way, are the issues with being chained to the crowd. The last two are being freed from the crowd. Being chained to the crowd causes fear and silence. They kind of play off of one another that if I'm more worried about pleasing the crowd, then what's going to happen is my convictions and my doctrine and my belief in God, there's going to be fear and there's going to be silence that go with that. In John chapter 12, verse 42 to 43, it says, Nevertheless, Many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. Look at verse 43. For they love the glory that came from man more than the glory that comes from God. Dear Jesus, help us. I think often we can read a verse like that and it causes us to ask a very internal question, a very personal question. How often do we love the glory that comes from humanity more than the glory that comes from God? How often do we want the acknowledgments and the cheers of the crowd than of Jesus saying, well done, good and faithful servant? And when we start to follow the crowd, there's fear and there's silence that, that kind of come with that. In Matthew 10, 28, there's a great warning it says, do not fear those that kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. It's a strong verse, isn't it? It's a strong verse that speaks of the authority that God has as judge and ruler of all, that, that he is the one that can destroy both our soul and our body. Yet how often do we put God's option second or God's conviction second or our relationship with God second because of the nature of of the crowd, because of the fear and the silence of the crowd. And here's what we fear. Here's, I wrote a few things down that we fear. The fear of being canceled. We've heard that word. I'm so tired of that word, but we hear that word. We've heard that word over the last two years especially, the fear of being canceled. That the moment you say anything, that is against the crowd or the culture, then you're canceled, then you're cut off, then you're pushed away. There's fear of persecution. Certainly any time that we go against the crowd, this blind Bartimaeus, he didn't know what the crowd would do to him. If he yelled louder, he was going against the crowd. The crowd told him to be quiet. Instead of being quiet, he got louder. He didn't know what the crowd was going to do to him. They could have stoned him. They could have drug him away. They could have thrown him out further. They could have put bodily harm on him. He's just sitting there, and he's going against the crowd, and he's not afraid of the persecution. I think oftentimes our fear and our silence comes because we start to go down the path of persecution. What will happen if I stand against what the crowd is saying? What happens if I tell somebody that I don't agree with what they're doing? Then there's persecution. And persecution comes with being a follower of Jesus, by the way. There's fear of being overlooked. Overlooked for that role. Overlooked for that job. Overlooked for that relationship. Overlooked for that promotion. Because of our beliefs and our convictions. There's fear, honestly, at the core, probably a lot of people, no matter the age, is the fear of being made fun of. The fear of being called a Jesus freak or a follower of him. And there's the fear of the names and the fear of the whispers behind the back. The fear of the gossip. The fear of the slander. There's finally the fear of rejection that happens. The fear that we have the dilemma that says if I don't follow the crowd, I might be rejected by the crowd. And, and rejection never feels good. Even on a worthy cause, it doesn't feel good to be rejected. It doesn't feel good to not be invited. It doesn't feel good to not be part of what the group or the crowd is doing, yet how often do we see Jesus speaking against the crowd? How often do we see the crowd moving one way and Jesus comes completely the opposite way? 
And so the chains that hold us, quite honestly, when it comes to the crowd is the temptation to please the crowd. It's the temptation to be quiet and to have fear and to have silence. I have some people that are going to come help me real quickly. So those of you that are here, if you can come up here, I want to just show you the, a picture. It's not going to be long, uh, an illustration, a picture. We've been using these chains each week. And, and of course, these chains that happen, I'll take one end, you can take the other end. So what happens here is simply this, and Ken, if you want to come swing over this way a little bit. Yes, straight out, straight out a little bit. To me, this is the picture I had of, of the chains of the crowd. Each week has been just a little bit different, but when we're chained to the crowd, the crowd pulls in, in so many different directions. It just pulls, if I want to go this way, I got the crowd over here telling me I got to go the other way. And so I might want to come this way because it's morally, ethically right, but I got the crowd. So if we're not strong, if we're worried about the crowd, I say, well, okay, I'll just, I'll just come over here where Chris is then. Chris, Chris is a smart guy. Oh, nope, nope. I'm going to go over here to Lee because Lee knows what he's talking about. And I'm going to go over here to Lee. Nope, nope. I'm going to go back over here to the Campbell Johns because they're a solid family. They certainly wouldn't lead me astray, would you? But then, nope, I got Ken pulling me this way. And it's just, you see what I'm saying? It's just, that's what the crowd feels like, doesn't it? It constantly just feels like I'm going this way. Oh, Nope, Chris, oh, nope, we'll go over here. When God wants us to go this way <laughs> towards him, we got this crowd that's constantly pulling us this way. And that's the visual that I think happens so often. It's that we know what we're supposed to do. But then we say, well, Rebecca knows what to do too, you know, and, and she's got it. Sure, she's got a little bit different view than I have. And so let me go over here and just see what she has to say. And then I'll go back over here. Well, Lee's actually a smart guy. He's got a master's in something, I think. <laughs> Super smart guy. He's, he knows what culture is. And I'm going to go over here. I'm going to listen to him. And Ken, he's been around forever. He's happy. He's happy today because the, the Tar Heels won last night. I wasn't sure. I was wondering if anybody would come to church today that were Tar Heel fans if they lost. But. But, you know, so Ken's going to whisper in my ear what he thinks. And it's just this constant back and forth that we go. Constant, constant, constant. And by the way, this is exhausting. It's exhausting to, to constantly want to go please the Campbell Johns, to go please Ken, to go please Lee. I mean, it's, just, it's exhausting. And yet we do this all the time. Thanks, guys. You can, just drop, you can drop the chance for here. So how do we get away with that? How do we push away from, from that feeling? I, I, I like visuals like this. Because I hope that this visual kind of sticks in your mind. It's simple, right? It's just a simple visual. But I want you to think in your life, before I go to the final takeaway, what are those chains that are pulling you in different directions? Just think about it for a moment. What are the chains in your life that, that are pulling you this way and this way and this way? What, what are those chains in your life? So here's the hope. Let's turn the corner to hope, the final two points. Here we go, real quickly. Number three is this, that Jesus will always stop for those calling to him from the crowd. The first hope that I have is found in verse 49, real simply, when it says, and Jesus stopped, and he said to call him. The same crowd that told him to be quiet finally looked at him and said, well, hey, take heart, get up, he's calling you. Almost to say, well, hey, it's your, it's your lucky day. It's your lucky day. Jesus heard you. We didn't want to help you, but Jesus heard you. So get up and go to him. I like what Hughes said, how he worded this. Hughes says that Mark records Jesus stopped and said, call to him. We must remember that Jesus is on the way to the terrible cross. The last stop is Jerusalem, just 18 miles away, and yet Jesus has time for this poor beggar. And I love this last line, the sun stood still. Jesus stopped and stood still. I began to think I went on a journey, and these aren't an exhaustive list, but I went on a journey in the Gospels. How many times did Jesus stop for somebody? And I want to give you a quick list. I think this is fascinating. 
We know that Jesus stops for the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, a woman that he never should have talked to and culturally and socially, yet he stops. The Gentile woman with a demonized daughter in Matthew 15. A woman with the issue of bleeding in Mark chapter 5. A woman that is an outcast because of her disease, yet Jesus stops and ministers to her. The prostitute in Luke chapter 7 that crashed the Pharisees' party, Jesus stops to. The man with a legion of demons in Mark 5, he stops for. In Luke 19, Zacchaeus, the tax collector who climbs up a little a tree, climbs up a tree so he can see him. In Mark chapter 10, he stops for children being brought to him by their parents. I thought that was fascinating. It's a great passage in Mark 10 where all the children are bringing, all the parents are bringing the children over to Jesus, and Jesus stops and ministers to kids. He stops for Jairus' daughter in Matthew chapter 9. He stops for a crippled guy at the pool of Bethesda in John 5. And the very first person he stops for after he's resurrected is Mary at the tomb in John chapter 20. And and you can make a list of several more, including every single disciple. I, I point this out because Jesus is still stopping and calling to us. I point this out because Jesus stopped for me. And he stopped for you. And he's willing to stop for anybody at any point, especially those in passage that are going against the rhythm of the crowd. That Jesus stops for them. The first hope that I have to break any chain is Jesus. Because he's the one that when we stop pulling against the crowd and say, Jesus, I need you here. I love that this list of people, most of whom maybe other than Jairus' daughter because he was a little bit of a ruler, her father, Jairus himself, most of them were outcast. Most of them were shunned and pushed away from the crowd or despised by the crowd. Nobody really liked Zacchaeus as a tax collector. Yet Jesus not only stops from him, but he invites himself over to his house. Jesus has time and he stops. And the encouragement for you is that if you choose to push against the crowd, take heart that Jesus will stop and with you. I love what he said, the son stood still. The fourth and final takeaway of how to do this is simply this, that going against the crowd requires faith. It requires faith to push against what the crowd is dictating and yelling for us to do. We saw it with Bartimaeus. Jesus says to them, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and he follows Jesus on his way, by the way. His faith made him well. It will require faith to push away from the crowd. Faith that says it doesn't matter what the crowd might say or even do because I choose to follow Jesus instead of the crowd. That is the, the push away from that. R.H. Hughes says this at the end. I just want to read this brief statement because he words it so well. He says, imagine how it was for Bartimaeus. Blind at the beginning of Christ's sentence and seeing at the end of it. No surgery, no bandages, no adjustment, just sight. He saw human beings for the first time. He saw the gawking crowd for the first time. He saw the city of roses, that's Jericho's nickname, hung with palm trees. He saw the hills of Moab off in the distance, but I love this last line, but the first thing he saw was the face of Jesus. The first thing he saw were the eyes of a Savior looking back into his now healed eyes. And he chose to follow him. Our prayer and our hope and our faith is that when we step away from the crowd, the first thing we see is Jesus saying, come follow me. I got you. Follow me. I'm with you. Follow me. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never abandon you. Follow me. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 2, I want to read this in the message version. It says, don't pass on malicious gossip. Don't link up with the wicked person and give corrupt testimony. Don't go along with the crowd in doing evil. And don't mess up your testimony in a case just to please the crowd. I love how that was worded there. Not only don't follow the crowd in doing evil, but don't mess up your testimony by following the crowd just to please the crowd. 
don't mess up the testimony of the hope you have because you value the crowd's voice more than Jesus' voice. Don't, don't value the crowd more than the Savior. It requires Jesus to set us free. It requires faith in him alone. My final question us as we close this morning is this. Do you have the faith to leap up from your seat and come to Jesus? Bartimaeus, it required faith to leap from his seat to run to Jesus. Do you have faith to drop the chains of the crowd, to jump up from where you are in order to follow Jesus? With that, I'd love for you to close your eyes and, and bow your heads this morning if you wouldn't mind as we begin to close. And I want to close this in prayer and then Pastor Ken's going to come and, and close out with a few things this morning. You might be here today and maybe you're struggling with, with the focus of the crowd. Maybe you're here today and just like the simple illustration of the chains, you are feeling chained to something that is pulling you. And maybe there's people in your life, the crowd in your life that are telling you to not talk about that God stuff anymore. To not follow Jesus anymore. Just to be quiet. Nobody wants to hear it. And for some reason, there's times where the temptation to please the crowd and the fear and the silence override our faith and trust in Jesus. So Jesus, right now, I pray that you would just begin to set free those who need freedom. The way I want to close this morning is this. Nobody's looking around, and I'm going to ask you to do something in a step of faith, quite honestly. For some of you, this might be a little uncomfortable, and it might be a stretch, but it's okay. I want to pray for anybody here this morning, just where you are. We're not going to have you come up front or anything because of time. But if you're here this morning, if you are honest, say, you know what, Andy, I am struggling with being chained to something that I know I got to let go. With every head bowed and eyes closed, would you just do me a favor and just stand to your feet real quietly? Just stand to your feet. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm chained to something that I got to let go. Just stand to your feet. Stay standing. Amen. Thank you. I want to pray for you this morning. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I pray for every single person standing here this morning. Lord, whatever that chain is, you are greater. Whether that's chains of the past, that's chains of wounds, that's chains of condemnation we talked about, chains of, of the crowd, guilt, all the things that we can get chained to. Whatever that chain is, I pray right now in Jesus' name, even as we sung earlier, that you are a chain breaker. You can break those chains. So Lord, right now, I pray for every single person. You know their heart. You know what's going on in their life. You know exactly that chain that is holding them to something that they need to be set free from. So right now, we pray freedom in Jesus' name. The Bible says that when we are free, we are free indeed. Jesus, you came to set the captives free. So right now, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would release that right now. That they right now would begin to feel that freedom, that release from something. And Lord, instead of just leaving it, we know that you are there with them. I pray that your voice would say, come to me, call to me that I am with you, and I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Jesus, we thank you for that freedom now. In Jesus' name, amen.